with the story of Paul and how we got turned around in his life. How many of you this weekend by chance got to go out driving yesterday? Any of you? It was perfect weather. I could almost see myself if I had a Harley Davidson, even though my wife won't let me drive one. But if I had one, I could see myself driving on the country roads or maybe riding with you know the family in a convertible. It was just the perfect weather yesterday. And that idea of going out on the road and not having a direction, but just going out is so freeing, it's so awesome. But I heard this story this week of a lady who did such a thing. See, she was out on the other side of Missouri driving, and she was coming up to a crossroads, and she didn't know which way to go, so she comes to the crossroads, she's riding with her son, she decides to turn left. She's going down this road, and it's a two-lane road, and it's pretty clear on both sides, you know, there's no trees on either side. She's driving on the road, and there's no cars. All of a sudden, one comes over the hill, and it's in her lane. Of course, it gets over, flashes its light, and she keeps driving. She keeps going down, and another car comes over the hill, flashes its lights at her. She doesn't know why, but he gets over and keeps on driving. All of a sudden, a semi, a big cement truck, you know, one of the big ones full of concrete, comes over the hill, is coming right at her, and stops in the road. The woman then pulls right up, nose to nose, stops. The guy in the concrete truck gets out, tells the lady to roll down her window, and says, man, this is a divided highway. You're supposed to be on that side. <laughs> At this point, she was so thankful. So thankful that she could have been coming a little bit further away and ran head on into that concrete truck to realize that she was in the wrong lane of a divided highway. Turning around, she, of course, went and got on the other side, realizing that she was being called to change her direction. She was headed. See, that's exactly what happened with Paul. See, his name is first brought up as being Saul, but it gets changed in chapter 9 later to Paul. So that's how I'm going to refer him. Paul, so you know, was a somebody. Okay? Paul was so proud of he was a somebody at the beginning, not realizing that it really meant to nothing. His being a somebody, he was born in Tarsus, the city of Sicilia. He was of the house of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the good tribes. He was circumcised on the eighth day. His father was a Roman citizen, so he gave him the rights of all the Romans, which was an honor and privilege. Also, he was brought up in the sect of the Pharisees. Age 14, he went to Jerusalem to the coveted school of Gamaliel, which is like going to seminary if you're a Lutheran. He became a Pharisee who was self-righteous and a zealot, thinking he was called to persecute the church. And then, where we left off, he's on the road to Damascus. See, Paul went and purposely got letters so he could find the Christians, bind them in chain, and drag them back to Jerusalem to be punished, to be thrown in jail. He thought his calling in life was to find these Christians, these members of the way, and punish them. Because that's what he thought the law told him to do. That's what he thought the law was leading him to do. Paul was being led astray. Paul even got to the point of being there when Stephen is stoned to death, leading the crowd and then bringing the garments to him to show his approval. <coughs> Paul was not a good man. Paul was the last person you'd expect to choose. But Paul ran into his own cement truck. Paul, as he's traveling down the road, headed to the message with such a mind frame, the light shines down and strikes him down where he can't see. And then he calls out, Who is it? Lord? He knew that everything had changed. See, each of us may have had that moment in our lives, or may be waiting for that moment, where God calls each of us. God puts these signs in the road in each of our lives to turn us around, to make us change direction, to make us see what we've gone astray. And there are moments where it's as simple as a road sign to get us to turn around. And there's other times 
where it takes a truck to slam right into us. See, God's calling us back, calls us back daily, calls us back in our lives when we head down the wrong path. See, too often we can be led astray by our jobs, by spending too, too much time on the internet, by spending too much time focused on our sports, by spending too much time not focusing on our family and God and what's important, but focusing on the things that don't count. And it usually happens when we let our temptations, we let our sin drag us down that road. We lead, we just like one of those bugs outside that led into the bug zapper, you know, the blue one. What happens? It's over. And that's the problem with sin. It's leading us to the bug zapper. Christ is the light that's leading us down the correct path, and we get led astray. And sometimes we see those in our lives, right next to us, that are being led astray. And that's where there's days we become Ananias. There's days where we're that man who's sitting there, and God says, I need you to go to this man. God called Ananias and I said, I need you to go to Paul and tell him he has to change. Tell him that he will receive his sight, and when he opens his eyes and sees, then he will be baptized. See, sometimes God puts us in the road to be that sign. And those people in our lives we see going astray. There's times it's not us. There's times there's those people walking right alongside us. And we're being called to be that person. See, too often, God puts things in our lives that we don't understand. Things that don't make sense, but they're there for a reason. See, when I was a mechanic, we always had different jobs to do. And I was working with this really senior mechanic. And I'm working on this one part I can't get out of the airplane. I used to be an aircraft mechanic, for any of you don't know. And I'm working on this one valve, I can't get it out. He said, go to my third drawer, pull it out, you'll see something that looks like a hammer, bring it here. And I go to his drawer, and I pull it out, and you, I'm looking for a little wrench, and he has a claw hammer, with this goofy thing welded on the back, but it doesn't look like any part you'd ever use to take something out of an aircraft. And I bring it to him, it fits in perfectly, this claw hammer, and immediately, the part comes out. But that's what God does in our lives. Many times he can put something that doesn't look like it fits. Paul doesn't look like he fits in God's world. He doesn't look like he fits in the gospel. But he's the perfect tool. He's the perfect instrument. He will be the one that leads the Gentiles to the cross. See, God used another instrument that doesn't make any sense. Jesus used a cross and three nails. See, a cross and three nails never would make sense to anybody that it brings salvation, but it did. And that would make God, God, and us just mere humans. He uses something so unexpected to change the life that it changes everything. It changes each one of us. And that's my prayer for this week. For each of you, that God will make you that instrument in others' lives so that they may see Amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, be with us in hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And God, dear Lord, today, make me an instrument. For you. Amen. Please stand as our service continues in the Apostles' Creed.